good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to the people joining us now. Uh, this is the session four of the Waters uh, webinar week, focusing on innovations and applications for the clinical workflow. Um, I am Gordon Bosch, and I will be your host. Uh, and before we get into the presentation, and sorry for the repeat for the ones that were in the previous session, um, but I'll have a few practical details. So at the bottom, you still have some material that you can download or uh, hyperlinks to web pages uh, that are all related to uh, the talk. Uh, you have a Q&A box on the top left. Uh, please use it um, in order to type in your questions uh, either now or while we go through the presentation, we'll have a Q live Q&A session at the end. Uh, and uh, last but not least, on the right, uh, you have a short survey, I mean, uh, three items uh, that we'd like you to, uh, to fill. Uh, that will allow us to get feedback from you and definitely trying to improve in the future or give, uh, you can give us as well some topics you'd like us to cover uh, with future events. Um, so, yeah, uh, as a presenter, we have Dominic Foley, uh, who is a senior scientist working at Waters Mass Spec uh, Spectrometry Headquarters in Wenslow in the UK, which is, and he's part of the Clinical Business Unit, which uh, Waters Corporation created 18 months ago. Uh, he joined Waters uh, 10 years uh, ago and has specialized in the development of LCMSMS clinical research applications with a particular focus on steroid mm -hmm. hormones as well as uh, biomolecules. Uh, so his presentation uh, title is LCMSMS Analysis of Theorem Thyroglobulin in for Clinical Research. Dom, the floor is yours. Thank you, Godo. Um, so yes, um, onto my presentation. This is the outline of what I plan to discuss today. Um, so. This slide contains just the outline of my talk where I'll briefly discuss the adoption of LCMSMS for protein analysis, where I will touch upon use of Skyline in particular and immunoaffinity using CISCAPA. This leads us on to the method for the LCMS analysis of serum thyroglobulin, which includes the Waters workflow solution with a brief overview of the sample preparation automation using the Andrew Plus uh, pipetting robot with one lab software. And then I will follow this with a higher level performance characteristic summary, followed by the overall summary of the method. So the top down or bottom up approach. Well, analysis of proteins has been done by mass spec for what a number of decades now, I'd say. This can be done uh, using the bottom-up approach. So this is using um, bottom-up tandem mass spectrometry. And this entails, as you can see on the right-hand slide in the illustration, the use of digestion. And this allows identification of a peptide, what is uh, specific to the target protein you're interested in. And this can be detected within the mass spec or the mass range of the mass spec. And it tends to provide greater analytical sensitivity than what is a top-down approach. And we also have an illustration of what a top-down approach is in this instance. And an example of that is the quantification of monoclonal antibodies using time of flight mass spectrometry. And although this can provide um, lower levels of sensitivity in comparison to a tandem mass spectrometry approach. Um, more sequence information can be obtained, so it can work well for like peptide mapping based applications. And for clinical research laboratories, uh, the bottom up approach does lend itself to adoption in those labs that already implement uh, LCMS methods for small molecules. So any approaches with this bottom-up approach will fit within those current workflows. And the methods can also provide comparable analytical sensitivity and improve selectivity to other platforms, such as immunoassay. 
Now, moving on to peptide selection for LCMS. MS. Uh, so, you can identify your protein of interest, but how do you go about selecting the target peptide to provide sufficient analytical sensitivity, uh, selectivity, and reproducibility of the workflow? So, the recommendations uh, at the bottom of the slide uh, that I've added um, are taken from the Hoofnagel paper in clinical chemistry from 2016, which is shown in the bottom right, and then the CLSI C64 guideline, which was released in 2021, provides an overview of these guidelines alongside some wider guidelines for protein quantification by mass spectrometry. So one of the primary things to consider is the uniqueness of the peptide. It needs to be done in, it needs to be unique in the matrix you are analyzing, uh, which provides an accurate measurement of the peptide you're interested in and therefore the protein that it is linked to. And peptides can be identified using a blast search to aid this. The peptide length uh, typically is between seven and 20 amino acids long. Um, less than that, you tend to lose your, your selectivity. More than that, you tend to have issues uh, around solubility, hydrophobicity, which I'll later detail. Trypsin is typically used for digestion of these proteins and these cleave at the C terminal of arginines and lysines. However, if you want to avoid uh, you do, how, you do want to avoid the ragged ends uh, that are associated with this. So those are amino acids in the sequence that would contribute to digestion variability. So those ragged ends are where you have like two lysines together or arginines together or more. So you could have a sequence of arginines and lysines that contribute to that variability. And also the possible miscleavage sites as well, which should be avoided, which include um, arginines and lysines adjacent to uh, prolines uh, at the C terminal side. Reactive residues should be avoided. Um, so you have uh, amino acids such as cysteine that are prone to disulfide bridge formation or even methionines which are prone to oxidation that could subsequently impact your MRM detection of the particular peptide. And unless they are of direct interest, modification motifs should be avoided that are prone to phosphorylation and glycosylation. And these could potentially impact uh, any targeted enrichment methods you're intending to use on the subsequent MRM detection. And you also have the MS uh, observability uh, using... Um, well, the MS observ observability between different systems. Um, so that is particularly important. Um, ultimately, it's all about how sensitive is this peptide on my mass spec, and that can change between systems. Uh, you do find that prolines within the sequence can also be a benefit in this regard in pro producing um, a sensitive and reproducible MS uh, signal, as long as it isn't adjacent to those lysines and arginines. And then at the end there, you have the hydropathy. So looking at how hydrophobic the peptide is, so that could uh, cause issues around solubility uh, of the peptide in solution, and also any subsequent carryover issues you do have with your uh, LC system. And any hydrophilic peptides could potentially cause issues around uh, stability of your LC retention time, so shifts in your retention time during batches, uh, between batches, uh, they could potentially be problematic. And moving on to uh, uh, digestion, param digestion parameters themselves, so looking at in silico digestion of proteins. Um, so to help assist with the ident identification of some of these target peptides, Skyline, can be used. So this is a freely available open source Windows application that helps build quantitative MRM methods and analyzing helps you analyze the uh, subsequent data. 
Uh, you can use a selection of enzymes, uh, including trypsin, uh, to perform in silico digestions within the software. And the resulting peptides can be filtered based on some of those criteria that I previously described. And a blast search can be performed on those peptides to identify their uniqueness within the matrix of interest. And also at the bottom, as you can see, uh, Waters created the MassLink Skyline interface to help with this process, where you create those methods um, and they're transferred into MassLinks. And you can optimize the parameters for the LCMS analysis of the peptides. The acquisitions and the, result, the results are then automatically moved between Skyline and MassLinks to provide the final MRM method. So having described the process of identifying suitable peptides that are representative of the target protein, there are a number of challenges associated with obtaining that peptide, follow it through the sample preparation process and doing this in a timely, reproducible, accurate and analytically sensitive way. So as you can see in the workflow, there are different options around purification uh, to get towards uh, a peptide endpoint. And that includes protein or peptide enrichment, where you may use an antibody or a similar sort of um, product to uh, bind to the peptide or protein of interest uh, to pull it out of uh, the matrix and effectively perform a cleanup. Or alternatively, you can do a, an SPE cleanup, but this often acts as more of a desalting step to just clean the background of the matrix up more. It doesn't necessarily remove other proteins or peptides within that matrix. Within that workflow, you also have the option to denature, reduce, alkylate, digest, and quench uh, the digestion of the protein. And also, possibly, you could introduce some sort of deglycosylation too, if you know that glycosylation could potentially be an issue. So overall, within this workflow, it does mean that the method development can be time consuming and expertise can be harder to come by with small molecule scientists uh, faced with large molecule challenges, uh, such as the molecular complexity you observe, the variability and also issues maybe around non-specific binding. Many methods are non-standardized with many choices, multiple reagents and limited reference measurements uh, procedures and standards and um, the sample prep itself can actually be quite extensive at times uh, much longer than small molecule analyses and the digestion of the proteins can take time and be a source of variability and inaccuracy having considered all this um that if you are able to improve the analytical sensitivity of the method during some of those specific steps, then you are able to simplify and minimize other steps in the workflow. So what I have in this slide here is uh, an example of an immuno affinity capture uh, for LCMS analysis using stable isotope uh, standards and capture by antipeptide antibodies or CIS-Kappa, which is a patented sample preparation method that improves the performance and mass spectrometry for measurement of pre-selected protein targets. So the peptide targets uh, are captured typically post-digestion uh, alongside a stable labelled internal standard. And this internal standard then compensates for changes in that capture recovery and any variability you do see in the LCMS and mass analysis. And Benefits of cis do include eliminating the impact of those protein interactions because you are performing that digestion effectively, chopping up all the different proteins to make smaller peptides and reduce the impact of those interactions that you would typically get on an intact basis. It enables the analysis of low abundance proteins, um, so providing higher analytical sensitivity for the analysis. You have something that, or the capability of something called stoichiometric flattening for analytes with different reference ranges. So effectively you reduce the recovery 
of a really uh, highly abundant analyte in comparison to something that's fairly low abundant where you want to improve the sensitivity. And in essence, the preparation does help uh, with cleaning up the sample. That enable, so it enables you to perform a rapid LC separation or even a direct analysis. And at, at the bottom of the slide, I've added some recommended reading around this. Um, one paper which you uh, discusses an overview of immuno affinity for LCM SMS, which was published in Clinical Chemistry in 2020. And it effectively provides an overview of its current use and perhaps where it could lead us into the future. Now, moving on to actually discussing thyroglobulin itself. So the need for greater analytical sensitivity and selectivity is actually highlighted in the requirements around the method for the analysis of thyroglobulin. So it's a 660 kilodalton dimeric glycoprotein, um, which is produced by the thyroid, thyroid gland. And it's a precursor to the thyroid hormones T3 and T4. Now, the measurement of thyroglobulin has been traditionally performed using amino assays. However, there are quite specific challenges around this, uh, where we're at uh, particular low concentrations, antithyroglobulin anti autoantibodies, and even heterophilic antibodies can cause interference with the measurement. And this sometimes can result in non-determinant uh, concentrations, or even in the case of particularly heterophilic antibodies, uh, higher than expected calculated concentrations. So with LCMS, this can uh, help circum circumvent this problem using sample digestion. So digestion of the sample cleaves the proteins, as I previously, previously described, and it removes or helps remove those protein-protein interactions. And including in this case, the interactions of the antithyroglobulin autoantibodies and heterophilic antibodies, which means that it does um, remove them as interferences. So publications around this uh, thyroglobulin analysis by LCM SMS typically focus on the triptych peptides VIF and FSP, which I've shown here in terms of the longer sequence information. And they're fairly key signature peptides for analysis by LCM SMS. And it just so happens that there is cis kappa material for both these target uh, peptides, which can help improve the sensitivity of the measurement compared to just doing a direct digest analysis following triptin, tri uh, triptid digestion. So for reference, again, I've added a couple of publications at the bottom of the slide that highlights the use of immunoaffinity for the analysis of thyroglobulin. So what I want to do is discuss what water offers as a solution to support your LCM SMS methods and how we have employed this to uh, be applied in the uh, method for thyroglobulin analysis. So we have expertise in automation with the Andrew Plus pipetting robot with OneLab, as well as other automation platforms such as Hamilton and TCAM. We have options in liquid chromatography with our Uquity UPLC systems, with our mass spectrometers such as the Zebo TQ Absolute and Zebo TQS Micro, and the data handling and review is handled within mass links and target links, and the limbs interface can help import and export data between your limbs system. So this is the water system solution for the analysis. We have the UPLC R-Class Plus FL system, and on that we have the XSelect HSST3 column to perform the uh, analytical separation. In order to obtain ultimate sensitivity for the, this analysis, we're using the Zevo TQ absolute mass spectrometer. And this is obviously worked by the, um, you can um, 
run this Zvartica Absolute using Masslinks version 4.2 with target links. And we're employing that CISCAPA anti faroglobulin FSP monoclonal antibody on magnetic beads to bind that peptide to give us the additional sensitivity we need. And the use of this antibody helps us use a relatively fast runtime in comparison to some other um, triptid digest methods on the market. So we're using a 3.3 minutes injection to injection time. Now onto the sample preparation. We've done some work around this, trying to simplify this process. Um, so for most um, protein digests, you are looking to denature. So we're adding 100 microliters of sodium deoxycholate, uh, which is a denaturing reagent with TSEP, which is a reducing reagent, uh, which is then within a buffer. And we add that to 250 microliters of serum. We mix and incubate this for 40 minutes at 37 degrees C. Following this, we add the internal standard and the trypsin, and we mix that at 30, uh, 30 minutes for 37 degree, at 37 degrees C, which effectively gives us those triptic peptides. And before we add the uh, CISCAPA anti-FSP magnetic beads, we want to stop that triptic digestion by adding some sort of inhibitor. And in this case, we're using the complete protease cocktail inhibitor. And once that quench is complete, after 10 minutes, we add those beads. And over a course of 60 minutes, we perform the capture. Um, now, potentially, you could run this for longer for some slight, slight improvements in sensitivity, but we had workflow considerations in terms of time to consider. So we thought that was a more suitable time for this analysis. You then wash the beads twice with uh, CHAPS in PBS. So CHAPS is a detergent that helps um, with the recovery of the um, target peptide and stops aggregation of the beads. And then you elute the beads with 50 microliters of 2% acetonitrile and 0.5% formic acid for 10 minutes at room temperature. We transfer that to a new plate and then we seal and fit what we use in, all, in this instance, an auto sampler magnetic plate to the collection plate. And that can help with uh, method robustness just in case any magnetic beads do get transferred over during that transfer step. On the Acuity UPLC I-Class system, we have these UPLC conditions. So we're using the HSST3 column 0.01% formic acid in water, where I found actually we saw twofold improvement in sensitivity compared to 0.1% formic acid in water. Um, an acetonitrile mobile phase B. And then um, we're doing a partial loop injection, which can help with carryover compared to some other injection modes. And then we're using uh, a step gradient in some instances across uh, the, the gradient table. Uh, so this involves the actual separation of the FSP peptide on the column, followed by a step up to a wash of the column at higher flow rates, which is why that gradient table is perhaps a bit longer than people would normally expect. As I said, we're using the Zvo TQ absolute mass spectrometer for this um, in positive ion mode. And we're looking at MRM transitions, uh, quantifier and qualifier ion with a stable isotope labeled internal standard. The quantifier ion is particularly sensitive compared to the qualifier ion. Um, so typically we see ratios of the ion ratios of around 10 to 1 for that quantifier to qualifier. And we're running the system in unit mass resolution. Before I move on to some of the performance characteristics and some of the workflow aspects uh, or the improvements of workflow around this, I just thought I'd discuss the Andrew Alliance Andrew Plus with OneLab. 
So we developed a protocol for this uh, system uh, using the Android Plus and currently all steps in the workflow and I've, I have stated except offline incubation are implemented on the Android Plus but in actual fact we've been able to automate the entire workflow on the Android Plus without user intervention and all steps from denaturation to addition a denaturation addition to Elliot transfer can be performed in the same script using a single deck layout. And that was our focus around this is can we uh, set up the Andrew Plus, add your samples in a well plate, so you add your 250 microliters of serum, and then effectively press go on the script and run it, and then at the end have samples to inject. And that's what we're able to achieve using this system. And we're currently looking at um, uh, running this on other automation systems. So this is just a, a quick overview of what it might look in one lab. Um, so you have the Android Plus set up on the left-hand side of what effectively you're trying to do with the reagent plate, uh, the digestion plate, and also the Eluit plate. These are some of the critical parameters we have set up in the Android Plus. And then on the right-hand side, you have what uh, the Android Plus looks like within OneLab when you're running the script. So effectively, it highlights what's currently running, the overall time uh, of the run so far and how long it is until completion. So it has some useful uh, indicators within the software for the user. Now looking at the LCMS workflow overall from sample to results. So effectively for this type of analysis, we don't typically expect really large batches being run by most laboratories. Um, so we're looking at sample preparation workflows based on around 48 samples. And we're able to do this typically uh, in terms of preparation time around three hours, 35 minutes or so for the entire workflow. Now that is a bit longer than small molecule analysis, but much quicker than most large molecule analyses uh, in terms of the preparation. The LC runtime is 3.3 minutes, which means that you turn around time to first result following the calibrator analysis uh, from initially loading the samples onto the Andrew Plus or even maybe doing this manually, can be uh, it's around four and a half hours. So we're using the plate format that speeds up the workflow and it's easier to automate. We're only using 250 microliters of serum, which is lower than other published methods. We're using 12 reagents, uh, seven of which are used during the sample prep. So it's uh, somewhat simplified compared to other methods as well. We're doing three incubations throughout the workflow, two temperatures. So we tried to standardize the denaturation and digestion at 37 degrees C and then we're running an ambient uh, for the capture. And then we're performing one centrifugation step at the end um, following elution. And the elution allows us to perform two injections for this. So if there is ever an issue with um, the method at any point, which has been known to happen in some labs, you do have enough volume to re-inject the sample at the end. So I'm moving on to performance characteristics associated with this. So we have the system setup and system suitability test. So I thought I'd add this in because uh, large molecule analysis isn't a standard practice for most labs. So what I thought I'd do is show what we can obtain uh, using our system in terms of an infusion on instrument setup and also the actual system suitability test we, we run on our systems too. So what we have here is an MS system check on the top. So you perform this when required, typically when you're setting up the system. And what we have on the right hand side is the, the FSP stable device sort labeled internal standard infused at 70 nanograms per mil at 20 microliters per minute. And that gives us uh, a peak, uh, one E to the seven based on a one minute acquisition. Um, so this can help benchmark your methods and gives you certain performance expectations of just the mass spectrometer alone during setup. And then what you can do 
after that is run a system suitability test, which again use the same uh, FSP stabilized or labeled internal standard, uh, a concentration this time of 0 0.05 nanograms per mil. And as you can see, we can see reproducibility across different runs across different days, demonstrating that the method is reproducible across those um, days on the same system. So it just gives you an idea of what to expect in terms of system performance. Now looking at analytical sensitivity and linearity. So we have on the left hand side some chromatograms at the very low concentration of 0.1 nanograms per mil using a surrogate serum. In this case, because uh, getting hold of blank serum for this analysis is quite challenging, we used our uh, chicken serum for calibration. Um, but in this, some people might have options around what to calibrate with in this instance, but this was what was available to us at the time. And then below that, we have an actual human serum sample with a calculated concentration of 0.1 nanograms per mil based on uh, our calibration line. And then in the middle, we have some functional sensitivity or analytical sensitivity experiments uh, around the lower end of the range and seeing how reproducible it is. So what we can determine is that um, down towards uh, 0 0.08 nanograms per mil, we do have reproducibility. Um, and we do lose that reproducibility, so it goes above 20% um, RSD as we go down towards 0 0.05 nanograms per mil for this method. And then an example of calibration linearity is shown on the right-hand side for this analysis, and that's ranging from 0.1 to 50 nanograms per mil, demonstrating we have quite a good linearity of the method as well. The precision matrix effects uh, and recovery um, of this uh, method is shown here. So we have the method precision. Um, so we have the manual and Andrew Plus automated precision testing. So I thought I'd run this manually and also automated because I know not everyone has access to automation. And what we can see is the manual precision is in the same ballpark really as the automated precision. So manually we're seeing less than 7.5%. RSD across the concentrations. So that's at 0 0.3, 3, and 35 nanograms per mil of thyroglobulin. And then at less than or equal to 9.5% for the automation. So we're seeing quite good reproducibility in both manual and automated formats. And then matrix effects, I thought I'd highlight this actually because just to show how clean uh, this is in regards to the immuno affinity. So we looked at uh, matrix effects across six individual human serum samples, and it was fairly minimal across those samples. They ranged from 79 to 104%. But well, when you include internal standard into that calculation, so you're compensating for those matrix effects, it does improve to 96 to 105%. Um, so it, it does highlight that, particularly for when you're in looking at uh, digests of serums, Matrix effects are, are quite significant, but we're using immuno affinity. It does clean up the sample quite a bit. Um, you can also see that in the previous slide when you're looking at the, the sensitivity we obtain of the signal compared to the background noise and how clean that sample is. On to some method agreement uh, assessments. So uh, this is where um, it gets slightly more complicated. So we looked at uh, the method agreement compared to 38 thyroglobulin UK NEQAS EQA samples and compared that to the old laboratory shrimp mean, which use uh, amino assays. Uh, a passing bad block analysis uh, demonstrates there is some significant proportional bias uh, associated with that analysis compared to them. And that's further verified by a bl uh, bland altman agreement, uh, where we're seeing minus 40% method bias of the method against the AALTM. And this, to me, because it's more proportional bias, it does indicate possible differences between method calibration of uh, this method and 
the methods that I'm comparing to. So if we actually perform some reassignment of the calibrators using the EQA ALTM, it does significantly improve that bias. So you're looking at the method bias close to minus 5.5 when you perform that uh, calibrator reassignment. So in summary, uh, we have a method for the analysis of serum thyroglobulin uh, for clinical research. We use CISCAPA sample preparation, followed by analysis on the Acuity UPLC R class system and Zevo TQ absolute to give us that sensitivity of 0 0.1 nanograms per mil from 250 microliters of serum. Offline automation uh, can be adopted for this where you don't have any touch time with the method uh, from sample transfer to the plate to uh, enrichment and then uh, injection on the system. Uh, excellent method performance was demonstrated across the range in regards to precision, linearity, matrix effects, carryover, which I haven't mentioned, but it it is acceptable, and also selectivity in regards to endogenous interferences, including actually uh, the uh, antifiroglobulin autoantibodies. We did perform a test around that to demonstrate we had no interference. Deviations in the method agreement um, were observed from EQA samples, but this was found to be related to differences in the calibration materials used. Um, so um, we were using the, uh, the um, Sepelco or Civilient CRM thyroglobulin material, whereas a lot of the immunoassay methods are using the BCR457 material, which I believe is no longer available for purchase. So we were reliant on the CRM material from uh, Sepelco or Civilian. Um, so before I finish my presentation today and move to the Q&A session, there are a few people I'd like to thank. They include uh, Ali Matthews and colleagues at the University Hospital of Birmingham. Uh, they provide some value discussions around the methodology and provided some samples uh, to perform some internal method comparisons. We also have Donna Austin and Rachel Carling at Synovis in London. Uh, again, helpful discussions around the method and some confirm confirmatory assessments around the use of the Cerulean CRM to see if we're seeing a uh, similar effect in terms of that bias we observed. And also I mentioned in this slide, uh, we have um, um, the CISCAPA team as well, who um, have been quite valuable to us in terms of getting up to speed with the method and to where we are today. So at that moment, uh, I'd just like to take the time to thank everyone uh, for their attention and their participation in the session today. And I'll just pass back to Gordo to take the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, if you have questions, please type them in the, in the Q&A box. Uh, we have a few questions already here, um, so we'll start with the first one. Uh, can uh, the application you have uh, shown, uh, can, can it be run on Xevo TQ access system or any other uh, Xevo system? Um, yes, yeah, so in theory, um, because we're running in um, positive iron mode, uh, the Xevo TQ access is comparable to the Xevo TQ absolute. So the real benefits of the absolute are more in uh, negative iron mode and also overall efficiency improvements in terms of um, the um, energy efficiency, uh, that sort of thing. So with this assay, I'd say that we'd be able to run this on the TV or TQXS, and we're currently trying to demonstrate that is the case. Um, so we will, in theory, have some information to hand to demonstrate that in the coming weeks. Okay, but then below that, clearly, it would not be sufficient. Yeah, so it, it, it'd be really difficult unless your analytical sensitivity requirements are slightly different to what we're trying to achieve. Um, then I would typically say for this type of method, you're looking to see as low as possible. Um, so other um, systems won't be suitable, really, for that analysis. Okay, thank you. Um...
Yeah, I mean, uh, so we have a question here. I believe you have already partially covered it, but uh, uh, how critical is automation in implementing this method? Uh, is there an option to run these on other robots? Um, yeah, so I find that when we're trying to discuss these sorts of approaches with customers, they're almost quite reluctant to use them because the magnetic bead approach is relatively new to them. But in actual fact, I actually approach it from like, it's kind of like an SPE, but in solution. So you, you're just doing a capture, washing and elution on that basis, but you're using magnets instead. Um, so automation is something that um, is a benefit, I'd say, to most customers, just to minimize the touch time. Um, but it's not wholly necessary if you feel competent enough to do it, do perform the method, as long as you have the suitable um, consumables like the magnetic plate, uh, them sorts of materials at hand to run the system. But yeah, we're, we're looking at, uh, we've automated it on the Andrew Plus. Uh, we're looking to run it on the Hamilton as well, uh, just to demonstrate it does work on, say, a higher end automated platform. Um, so that is something we are looking to do in the, the coming months as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, and again, this one as well, I believe you, yeah, I think you already have explained some of it, but uh, you know that there is a large difference in the method against the AT, A, sorry, ALTM, uh, and this can be explained by the calibration difference. Uh, can you elaborate uh, on this a bit more? Yeah, so um, in regards to this, I suppose the, the ALTM is an overall measurement of different um, systems that contribute to the scheme. So there could be large discrepancies within that as well. And that's what we have to consider when we're trying to compare a single method to an overall uh, comparison with the ALTM. So how the, I briefly touched upon this, how they're calibrated is slightly different to what we've done. So they're calibrating to the BCR 457. And within that, they could see, like I said, large differences in their performance. It just so happens, whereas compared to the scheme, we're seeing that minus 40%. We're using the civilian CRM material and not many laboratories have been using that, but that's the only material available to us currently. And we just tried to demonstrate that, in essence, the method was comparable by if we, do, if we did reassign some of those calibrators. And for all we know, we could um, compare well to certain uh, systems within that ALTM measurement. It's just that it just so happens the overall measurement, we don't see a fantastic bias for us. So it, it's something that we, we have actively investigated and we're looking we we have demonstrated that the the calibration is particularly important and reassignment of calibrators may be a benefit in that regard definitely we have uh, a last one here uh, is there any evidence that the cis kappa is compromised in capturing thyroglobulin in the presence of thyroglobulin mm -hmm. antibodies yeah so um I think I very, very briefly touched upon that at the end in the summary slide. I didn't actually have the data for that. So what we did is we had um, access to some uh, antiviroglobulin, oh, a serum that contained antiviroglobulin antibodies at particularly high concentrations. And effectively, we treated that as an endogenous interference and spiked that into a serum sample containing viroglobulin. We compared that to a control sample at the same concentration, and effectively our result was within ten percent with the within the control. So it effectively demonstrated that the the antiviral antibodies weren't interfering with the cis kappa capture on that basis. Excellent. Probably you would need, you would need to do a bit more investigation, but uh, it's very promising. Yeah, certainly. Like we, 
it, a lot a lot of the time it's access to them sorts of samples for us so it's it's um we were we were recently able to demonstrate uh, that that was the case and it does it is backed up by the theory in that sense so we are digesting the uh auto antibodies uh that could effectively impact that measurement um so the theory is backed up in practice based on what we've seen okay excellent um we have no more questions currently if you really want to type one please do so If not, then I will uh, thank the attendants again uh, for being here with us, uh, and especially you, uh, Don, uh, for this presentation, which was really enlightening. Um, the whole uh, session will be available on demand uh, in a few days. Uh, so thanks again, and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.